series, and this series is, of course, Truth from the Bible, uh, Questions and Answers, and uh, this is one of the questions that was turned in, and that is this, uh, how can I stop wasting time? So it's going to be a very practical lesson tonight, probably something you can put into foot uh, leather very soon and practice. Uh, we all want to redeem the time even better, and so this will give you some practical applications as to how to be able to do that. In our series, we have taught so far on cremation or burial, uh, how to handle uh, when I'm hurt, how do you handle that, uh, why do some people, some young people rebel, how do I better my finances, and then, of course, last Wednesday night, are angels real? Uh, let's take our Bible and look at a couple of scriptures tonight. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, Ephesians 5, 16 and 17. Bible says this, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Verse 17, wherefore be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Now, first God says to redeem the time. He tells us why, because the days are evil. And then he says, now don't be unwise, but you need to be understanding what the will of the Lord is. I want to submit to you, uh, people that do not conscientiously redeem the time sometimes have a difficult time understanding what the will of the Lord is because their mind scatters so very, very much. And so it's important to be able to redeem the time. Let's pray together. Father, bless. We do pray our gathering tonight. We ask for your blessing. And uh, Lord, we pray that you would do just that. As we get into some Bible principles tonight on how to stop wasting time. And Lord, we thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jonathan Swift's classic, uh, Gulliver's Travels, there was the, uh, what you call the uh, Liberations, and uh, they saw that uh, uh, Gulliver had this pocket watch. They looked at him because of that, and they thought that he was a god because he said this always. He said, uh, before I do anything, I need to consult first, and he would pull out his pocket watch, and he would look at it. And sometimes I feel like that's the way we are. We are so time conscious that, okay, I'm going to see if I can fit this in. Uh, can I fit this conversation in? Can I fit this person in? Can I fit this program in? Can I fit this event in. When England adopted what they call the Gregorian calendar back in 1752, they decided to drop 11 days off the calendar. And so it went from September the 2nd to September the 14th. The people started crying out and they said this. They said, please give us back our 11 days. Now, to be honest with you, the 11 days just did not disappear but the measurement of those days disappeared. Now, can I tell you, we have to be very, very careful that we do measure our days, but we don't need to be so uh, tight that God cannot lead us to be able to use us, especially when people uh, need some help. Let me give you some statements. Time is valuable. Time is valuable. Uh, you know, in actuality, you know, your time is God's time. Uh, we are supposed to dedicate ourselves to the Lord, and so our time is God's time. Now, God says redeeming the time, and you think about that, that's something that you have to skillfully manage. And by the way, uh, time has been entrusted to you, it's been entrusted to me to be able to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Successful stewardship of time uh, will bring glory to God. And so as we successfully steward our time, it brings glory to God. Statement number one, life is time. Uh, you only have so much time on earth. You only have so much time to live. Life is time. The uh, Bible uh, illustrates that in the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 8, where it says to everything uh, there is a reason and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to be plucked up, 
that a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rid and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time to war and a time of peace. So we see this, that God has an appointed time for everything in life. Ecclesiastes, as I read, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. So God says, I've got an appointed time. As you saw in the scriptures there, there is that time to be born. There is that time to die. That's an appointed time. There is a time to plant. There is a time to pluck up. That is appointed times. There is a time to kill. There is a time to heal. Uh, those are appointed times. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, the first portion of it says this, that he made everything beautiful in his time. So in his time are all things made beautiful. So it's important for us to understand that uh, God said in his time. And uh, the problem is we want God to work according to our timetable. But sometimes God doesn't choose to work according to our timetable. Sometimes we need to back off and stop being impatient. I'm not talking about necessarily with each other. I'm talking about being impatient with God. Sometimes you have to back off and say, okay, God, I'm, I, I realize that you're in control and that I'm going to give you this portion of this problem. I'm going to give you this problem. I'm going to give you this event. I'm going to give you this situation. I'm going to give you my life to be able to control. So God, what he does is God, if you will, he ties time and eternity together. When somebody gives you their time, they're giving you a part of their life. They only have so much life to give. Young people, when your parents give you their time, they're giving you their life. When somebody gives you their time and their energy, no matter how long it is or no matter how short it is, they're giving you a part of their life. So how do you use that limited amount of time, okay? Let, let me just share a couple of things. How we use our limited amount of time here proves uh, how we view eternity. Uh, that's why I think that soul winning ought to be a, an important aspect of every person's life. Reading your Bible ought to be a, 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 a portion of your life. Coming to church ought to be a portion of your life. Uh, spending time with your family and loving your spouse and loving your children and spending time with them. Uh, you only have so much time to be able to spend. So make sure that you spend it importantly. Wasting time is wasting life. Statement number one, I said life uh, is time. Statement number two, our time is his time. Our time that we have is his time. And the Bible points that out. Over in Psalm uh, 31, verse 14, the Bible says, And I trusted in thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my God. Listen to it in verse uh, 15 that says, My times are in thy hand. So as many times as God gives you, God says, just want you to realize, hey, it's in my hand. And David says this, deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. So uh, the time that we have, we ought to use it. Now why? Because God has given us, he's entrusted us with that time. Now, I don't know how much time God would give me, and I don't know how much time God would give you on earth. But I do know this, the time that he gives you, you ought not to waste it. You ought to make sure that you glorify him in it. We're stewards and managers of the time uh, that we have and that God has given us. Statement number one, I said uh, that life is time. Statement number two, our time is uh, his time. Statement number three, uh, time is to be redeemed. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means this. Uh, that means that you uh, simply, you, you buy it back is what he's talking about. Look at your Bible. Ephesians chapter 5, verses uh, 15 through 17. The Bible says, see then that we walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, 
but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So redeem, it means this. It means to buy back. That's what it's talking about in verse 16. It means we're not supposed to waste it. We're supposed to buy it back. Don't waste the, the time. Um, uh, over uh, in the, the Bible, over and over again, uh, you see that opportunities, even in our day, opportunities pass quickly. Opportunities to be a blessing to someone, opportunities to be good to someone, opportunities to share the gospel, opportunities to be able to uh, put the concentrated effort in teaching your children in the way that they should go. Opportunities uh, to do good pass quickly if you're not careful. They're going to go by. It was uh, uh, Peter uh, Drucker that said this. He says, time is the sacredest resource and unless it's managed, nothing else can be managed. So if a person doesn't manage time, guess what? You're going to have a hard time managing anything else. Why? Because life is consumed of time. Uh, you and I, uh, we only have one life, and that's it. And soon it will be passed. So what do we do? We take the time that God has given us and invest it wisely. So life is time. Our time uh, is his time. Time is uh, to be redeemed. Statement number next, there's time stealers. Now what is it that could steal your time? A statement, think about this, laziness. Laziness could steal your time. You know, uh, oh, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 9, the Bible says, he also that is slothful in his work, it says, is brother to him that is a great waster. A great waster. Waster of what? Life. Waster of what? Time. So a person that's lazy is a great waster. Proverbs chapter 19, and verse 15, the Bible says this, slothfulness casteth into, it says, a deep sleep. And an idle soul shall suffer hunger. So uh, the Bible talks about how uh, we're, we're lazy as our circumstances allows us to be. Average person has a day off. What do they do? If they get up at 4.30 every morning, nine times out of ten when they have a day off, uh, they might get up at 4.30, but it might not be in the morning. It would be in the afternoon. Now, why? Because they've decided that, you know, hey, it's my day off. I'm going to take, okay? So what the Bible is talking about here is oftentimes, more than not, we see that circumstances causes us to make decisions. Uh, sometimes leisure is a nice word for laziness. Well, you know, I just want to kick back. How many of you, uh, come on now, be honest with me, because I, I don't want to feel alone, okay? But how many of you, when you take a vacation, when you come off of vacation, you feel like that you have to get rested because you took the vacation. Would you raise your hand and testify? That's where I am. You know, now why? Because I got out of sync. I got out, I, you know, it, it uh, became difficult for me. Why? Because, you know, things were not measured the way that they used to be measured. Uh, things were out of syncopation. Things were out of order. Things were out of schedule. Things were out of booking. They say that teenagers, I'm picking on them a little bit, but this is the statistic I have, that teenagers backslide more when school is out than they do when school is in. My question would be, does that not have something to do with schedule? Well, sure. You know, when we're unscheduled people, we have a tendency to do things that maybe is not best for us. All right, so time stealers. What is that? Laziness. Statement number next, idleness. Idleness. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 18, the Bible says, By much slothfulness, the building decayeth. I was taken back, I really was, when I went up to Maryland and I preached at Soul Winner's Banquet. I grew up uh, just 30 minutes from Gettysburg, where I attended church in Westminster, was only 11 minutes from Gettysburg. So I was very familiar with Gettysburg. I mean, it was in my backyard, and, and so oftentimes me and friends would go up to Gettysburg and familiar with all of the burial fields and all the battles. and. You know, when Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, the date of that and the time and stuff like that. And so uh, we, I, I told my host, I said, look, my, my plane, I've deliberately 
uh, booked my plane a little bit later than early in the morning because uh, it was during this time that uh, the Gettysburg address was given. And I'd like to go up to Gettysburg. I'd like to see it. Hadn't seen it in 20 years. So I'd like for us to be able to drive up to Gettysburg, if you don't mind. And so we drove up to Gettysburg, and uh, as we drove up to Gettysburg, I was able to see, you know, several different houses and stuff like that, but also did some other stuff. I, I went by the old farm. I was raised on a 180-acre farm in Millers, Maryland, and I went by the old farm. You know, and I, I don't remember how, how bad it was because it wasn't bad back then, but you see, nobody tended to it. Nobody took care of it, and so it was all dilapidated. It had fallen, mostly the old farmhouse where I grew up, had fallen into the ground. I mean, all the shutters were gone. Most of the siding was gone. You saw the bare wood. I mean, the porch was gone. The old summer house where Mrs. Wagner used to prepare summer sausage when we'd uh, kill uh, uh, the hogs and stuff like that, and, and, and all of that was gone. The swings were gone. The barn was gone. Uh, the old mill was gone. I mean, all the just dilapidated, completely ruined. Now, why? Because somebody did not take care of it. Now, I want to tell you, that's the same way it is with your spirit. That's the same way it is with you serving God. If you don't give it attention, eventually it dilapidates. Eventually you get backslidden and you do it gradually to the point, to the place that you don't even realize how bad you are until an outsider looking in begins to testify how bad it's really gotten. Uh, the same way it is with your physical body, the same way it is mentally, the same way it is in your marriage, the same way it is in child rearing. You know, everything that we touch, we ought to touch to be able to change and to keep right. Because if you don't give it attention, it automatically dies. It automatically begins to decay. All right? And the Bible teaches that. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 18, I'll finish it. The Bible says, By much slothfulness the building decayeth. It says, And through idleness of the hands the house, look at it now, droppeth through. So the Bible says when you don't give it the attention, oh, I know it, I know it to be true. I know it uh, that all of a sudden a marriage uh, that does not keep Christ first and does not uh, try to please the Lord and, and they get away from the things of God before you know it, they start having marriage trouble and the family that doesn't uh, keep uh, attention to their children and trying to help them, they start having child problems. I mean, it happens every single time, all right? So there's that idleness. Few things are more dangerous uh, to a person's character than having nothing to do. Amen. Having nothing to do. You know, I found this out. There are people that retire. And when they retire, they decide, I'm retired. I don't have to do anything. And I find out some wind up sitting in chairs, not getting up like they used to, not walking around like they used to. And before you know it, they become decrepit. For you know it, they have a hard time getting up. For they, know, you, they start stiffening up. Come on. You ever see someone in the hospital? I'm talking about a younger person in the hospital. Same thing happens. Uh, I, I'm saying this. I'm saying that we have to be careful that we do not become somebody that does nothing. Uh, idle, the word idle means this. It means lacking worth. It means or, or bases or useless or not occupied or employed, not turning to uh, appropriate use or inactive, inactive. You know, so a person that's idle, they're inactive. We had a guy that was at our church many years ago in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, Central Baptist Church, and he was a professional weightlifter. I mean, just a professional weightlifter. Uh, my wife will remember this. Then he got a disease in his arm. When he got a disease in his arm, it was painful to move that arm. And it was so painful to move that arm, he decided, I'm not going to move it as much. Within five years of not moving that arm, this arm, you looked at it, and I'm talking about muscles uh, uh, just, just coming out of the shirt. I mean, he could just go like that, and muscles are flexing everywhere. But when he went like this, it was just a puny piece of flesh uh, uh, attached to that which is a bone. That's hardly nothing there whatsoever. 
The doctors told him, they said, now look, whatever you do, you keep exercising that, keep exercising. I'm so proud of Brother Hilliard. I called him up on Saturday just to check on him, and I said, how you doing? He said, I'm outside, preacher, and I'm weed-eating. I said, that's good. That's very good. You know, for those of you that are senior citizens, uh, do as much as you possibly can. Don't give up your license till you have to. Don't give up going until you have to. Uh, don't give up, if you will please, life and uh, exercise and going about and helping people. Hey, if I were you and I had nothing to do, I'd go volunteer at the church, volunteer in the community, volunteer at a soup kitchen, volunteer at a rescue mission, volunteer to do as much as you possibly can. You say, why, preacher? I deserve, I mean, after all, I'm retired. Yeah, I understand that, but that'll put you in an early grave if you're not careful. Man. So you've got to keep moving. All right, and so we understand that uh, inactivity. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Listen to it now, unto good works. So he says, I've created you unto what? Good works. Doesn't the Bible say in our New Testament, Jesus went about doing good? Some of you teenagers, and I'm just being honest with you, the reason you're getting into trouble is because you have too much idle time. If I were you, I would volunteer. Uh, if you can't do anything else, come up to the church and just say, is there anything I can do? You might just be shocked how much we could give you to do. There's walls that need to be painted. I mean, there's flooring. Uh, uh, you know, there's carpet that needs to be ripped up. There's letters that need to be stuffed. There's nurseries that need to be cleaned. There's bathrooms that need attention. On Fridays, we have a lawn mowing crew and they need extra help. I, I'm saying this, I would not just sit around and be idle. I wouldn't do that. Uh, idle people get themselves into trouble. The Bible says uh, that we're supposed to go about. Christ created us in Christ Jesus uh, to do good works, which God hath before ordained. That means he set in place. The Bible says uh, that we should walk in them. So God said, I've got, I've got ordained. I've got good works for you to do. Now your responsibility and my responsibility is to find them and to walk in them. Walking implies activity. Walking implies activity. You know, they say that as you get older, it's best not to run. That's what they say. Now, I don't know how old old is when they say as you get older. You, you, you do your own research. But they say it's better to walk. It's better on the knees. It's better in many other uh, places in your body. It's better to walk. But that is activity. Another one is procrastination. Uh, people do not do the desired will of God. They don't redeem the time. They have things that are stolen from them because of procrastination. Matthew chapter 25 gives a truth where it says, Matthew 25 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, the Bible says, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now you know the rest of the story, and I'll not read it, but if you'll read down verse uh, through verse 4, you'll see that five uh, had no oil. They were foolish, and five planned ahead, and they took oil, and the Bible calls them wise. Now, what is that? Uh, there were those that were procrastinators, and there was those that did not procrastinate. And God does not want us to procrastinate. Jeremiah chapter 8, and verse 20, the Bible says the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And so uh, uh, people procrastinate this thing about salvation. I was out soul winning on Saturday and uh, had the privilege to lead a couple of people to Christ. But I talked to this one young man, young man is in his 20s, and I witnessed to him. And here's what he said. He said, I'm not ready for that yet. When I get ready, I'll do that. I have, that's what he said, the rest of my life. But you have no idea when the rest of your life will come to a conclusion. You just have no idea. There's the urgency of not procrastinating. Uh, the Bible talks about uh, that the harvest is past, the summer is ended. Uh, what a sad notation, and we are not uh, 
yet saved. Uh, notice this, that if we don't obey God today, there's a high probability that we're not going to obey him tomorrow either. A person says this one time to me, he said, uh, as I was preaching, as a young preacher, and they said, well, I just want you to know that I've reserved, it's nice to know, I reserved my senior years to serve God. And I looked at him, he was an older statesman, but I is in his 70s, and I was just a young preacher in my 20s, but I looked at him and said, sir, I've got news for you. If you're not serving God today, you're probably not going to serve God tomorrow. You know, he never did serve God. He died, never did serve God. Now, can I tell you, there's a high probability if you're not putting God first today, you're probably not going to put him first tomorrow. Uh, you know, we want to get in shape, but we want to do it without exercise. You ever hear somebody says, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get in shape and <laughs> I'll exercise later. You ever hear somebody say that? Person says, I want to lose weight and I've got news for you. I'm going to start tomorrow. And then tomorrow never comes. Okay, moving. Amen. Distractions. Sometimes we do not serve God. Sometimes distractions are big stealers. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 7, the Bible says, But uh, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ? Listen to your scriptures. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, Brother, and I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before, here's what Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 15, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, uh, be thus minded, listen to it now, that if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. What's he saying? Keep your mind focused on Christ. Do not be that individual that allows that stealer of distraction to get you, you know. Now, some people can multitask. Some people are amazing to me. You ever see somebody that goes to a board and they got a marker in this hand and a marker in this hand and somebody tells them what to write and they write with both hands? You ever see somebody like that? You ever see a switch hitter? Gets up and he picks up the bat. He can hit it left-handed just as well as he can hit it right-handed. You ever see somebody like that? Uh, you ever see somebody that uh, uh, can uh, drive here in the United States no problem whatsoever as the steering wheel is on the left side of the vehicle? They can fly to London, England, or some other uh, type of European state, and they can take and uh, get in that car, and they have the steering wheel on the right side of the vehicle, and they can drive just perfect there too? You ever see somebody like that? Now, if you have, I've got news for you. They're few and far between. Uh, most people are single-minded. And so let's not be tempted to be distracted. More than any other time in history, I believe uh, we are tempted to be distracted. Uh, there's, there's that temptation to have that distraction in your life. Why? Because there is so much today. I mean, my, so much today. When I was coming up, we'd go outside and uh, mom would use those tin foils, you know, as we'd bake potatoes and stuff like that. And then uh, she would, and we love potatoes, baked potatoes. Oh my, that's heavenly. And so she'd bake those potatoes. She'd take that tin foil and she'd throw it over there like that. Well, when we had family gatherings, guess what? I mean, I'm talking about 20, 30, 40 wells would show up and they'd take that tin foil. We'd have those potatoes and they'd throw them over there like that. And we, uh, young uh, people, would get that tenfold we would wrap it up and real real tight we had baseballs and we went outside and uh, you know sometimes if you wanted a heavier baseball it wasn't no trick to it you just put some rocks in the middle of it or find yourself a rock and put and put that tenfold around it real real tight and it was no problem you added weight to it and we would use those as baseballs we'd use those as softballs all right and we would uh, throw that now it didn't last very long especially if you had a heavy hitter I mean, you know, it was just, pew, especially you had a rock in the middle. But we had fun. We had fun catching lightning bugs. I'm talking about fun. Hide and go seek. You didn't have to have a lot of money to have fun. King of the mountain. Had fun. Now, my brother and I, we did, we, uh, we'd wait till mom and daddy got gone. You know, they left. And so uh, we play king in a mountain, and we get on the roof. 
and we would really prove who was the king of the mountain. Now, for those of you that had two-story buildings, I wouldn't suggest that. And I wouldn't suggest if you had a one-story building. Matter of fact, I don't suggest it at all. It's just bad, okay? But, uh, but can I tell you, uh, in, in, uh, in, in history, people are uh, uh, being distracted. Decide the one thing that you want to accomplish and do it. And then let me give you this, and this is some time management helps. Time management helps. Uh, pray and plan your day. Now, I use a plan. Uh, uh, most of the staff guys that uh, work here and uh, many of the faculty that work here, they have some type of planner, some type of device that helps them to be able to plan out their day, their week, their month, their year, and they put things down on paper. But pray and plan your day. Now, don't do it when you come to the office. If you work in an office job or you have people that's working beside you or under you, plan it out the day before. Uh, you know, I, I, can I tell you how to show up on, uh, to Sunday school on time? For those of you that um, are lacking uh, the ability to show up for Sunday school and to iron your clothes Saturday night. Get them out, lay them out, iron them Saturday night. Don't wait to get up Sunday morning and try and find that favorite tie that you've not been able to find for the past eight Sundays either. No, no, get everything out, get everything laid out, and iron everything on Saturday night. That way Sunday morning goes a little bit easier. Amen. If you can find a way to cook Sunday breakfast Saturday night, do it. But do as much as you can ahead of time. Those that are business and has uh, business people, businessmen, business ladies, I find out that they're very productive because most of the time they plan their, their week at least a week in advance or they'll plan their days, days in advance. There's been many times where somebody said, well, you know, hey, uh, can you work that in? I sure can. I can work it in. I can work it in on this day because I'm planning things out. You know, it is good to be able to manage your time, pray, and plan your day. Prioritize, prioritize. Uh, uh, there's never enough time to do everything, but there's always enough time to do the most important thing. And so prioritize. Statement number next, do difficult things first. Whatever you don't like, do, do it first. Now, I don't know what it is. It might be that you don't like reading your Bible. Do it first. By the way, that ought to be a part of your morning agenda anyway because time all of a sudden crowds that out. The devil will make sure of that. But do things first when you leave the house uh, that you don't like. Statement number next, they said this, uh, only 2% do excellent work without supervision. Only 2% do excellent work without supervision. Statement number next, uh, complete task first. Complete task. Uh, task first get it all done uh, statement number next uh, work from a to-do list get yourself a running to-do list you might want to alphabetize it uh, but get yourself or, or maybe use uh, numbers to one two three and put it in proper order uh, first things first but work from a to-do list okay you build up or you pull down if you will your reputation by everything that you do and fail to do you tell somebody, hey, I'll be there, and you don't show up. Boy, I tell you, that pulls down your reputation. Right. Well, I promise you I'll take care of it, and you don't take care of it. You've just hurt your reputation. So make sure if you tell somebody you're going to do it, do it. Especially if you have kids. Can I tell you what? That is detrimental to your kids. Be careful what you say to your children, because if you say, I'm thinking about we're going to go to the store tonight, what they heard is, we're going to the store tonight. They didn't hear that, I'm thinking about. And now when you don't do it, they look at it as you broke your word. And if you broke your word in this area, you probably can't be trusted in that area either. So learn to keep your word. Be careful about your words. Statement number next, uh, learn to say no. Our children, when our children would be wanting to get something and wanting to get something quickly, they would come up and they would say, Dad, I need an answer now. And I would say, if you need an answer now, the answer is always no. If you're going to pressure me and say, I need to know it right now, no. The answer is no. Now, I might come back later on and think on it, 
But uh, uh, don't uh, be afraid of learning to say no. Statement G, uh, create deadlines. Deadlines are not destructive. Deadlines are powerful and can help you to accomplish a cause. Uh, have a deadline, ladies, of when you're going to uh, 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 wash the clothes, dry the clothes, fold the clothes, go to the doctor, mow the lawn, shingle the roof. Ladies, have a deadline. Now, I, I'm saying this. I'm saying create some deadlines. Create some deadlines to be able to have things done. Statement number next. Thank you for paying attention. Make yourself accountable to someone. Make yourself accountable to someone. Statement number next. Uh, make goals public. Uh, not boastfully, not proudly, but that you're wanting to accomplish this. Make goals public. Statement number next. Delegate. Delegate. Uh, there was, uh, I think, Brother Craig, you can help me. Uh, Sylvia, you help me. The man that mowed our lawn up in Tennessee, brother, brother Craig, you help me. Where's Craig? You don't know either. There was, there was a great man. But he was, who was it? Weldon. Weldon, thank you. Brother Weldon's in heaven right now. But uh, it's not because he mowed the lawn. <laughs> but he, he was, a, he was a, a, a World War II vet. And one day, we had a, a large piece of property up in Union City. We had a riding track mower, and I, I'd get out there, and I'd ride that mower. Brother Weldon came up to me one day, and he said, Preacher, what are you doing? I said, well, Brother Weldon, I'm sitting here on the tractor, and I'm mowing. That's what I'm doing. He said, why are you doing it? I said, well, Brother Weldon, the grass is growing. That's why I'm on the tractor mowing. He said, you don't need to be on that tractor. I said, Brother Weldon, it is not going to mow by itself. It just won't. It'll crash. It won't do it. He said, young man, get off that tractor. Now, I said, yes, sir. He got on that tractor. He mowed one strip, and he said, that's it. He said, this is a piece of trash. He said, it's going to take you forever to mow this lawn. He said, I've got a mower that's twice as big as this. He said, your time is more important than mowing this lawn. He said, you got doors to knock, you got people to visit. He said, I can't visit people. I don't know what to say to people. If they come to the door, I run. He said, but I can sit on a tractor and I'm only in my 70s and I know how to mow. And he said, this is something I can do for God. While you're serving God on the field, I can sit on a tractor and serve God in the seat. I said, you really feel that way? He said, I feel that way 100%. I said, okay, it's yours. Every week he'd come up and he'd sit on, he'd bring his tractor up, a flatbed, he'd roll that thing off. He, he'd, uh, he'd, uh, if I was there on property, he'd come by the office and see the secretary and say, you tell the preacher I'm about to serve God. And he loved it. We had a fellow by the name of Billy Lynch. Billy Lynch uh, was a good man. Uh, but Billy Lynch, he was riding by the church one day, and he saw that we got back in the bus ministry. This is back in Tennessee days. And he said, I saw you got back in the bus ministry. You guys been out of the bus ministry for 20 years, and you're back in it. He said, that's amazing to me. He said, I love the bus ministry. He said, I'm going to join the church just so I can drive that bus. And I said, okay. And so he joined the church, made some decisions in his life, and got faithful and stuff like that. And he said, I want to drive the bus all day on Sunday. Can I drive the bus all day on Sunday, preacher? I said, Billy, we don't have gas to drive the bus all day on Sunday. Who said, he said, the church has to pay for gas? He said, I'll pay for the gas. He said, I just want to sit in the seat and pick up boys and girls. That's all I want to do. He said, I'll drive the bus all day long. Just let me sit in the seat. He said, this is how I can serve God. He said, Preacher, if you'll let me sit in that seat, I'll fill the bus up every Sunday. Just let me go pick up boys and girls. I said, Okay, Billy. So he went out. He started to get boys and girls on the bus. He picked up boys and girls every Sunday morning. We had a Spanish uh, a church on Sunday afternoon. He'd run the Spanish route for me on Sunday afternoon, and he'd go pick them up. Then he'd come back and get in the van and go pick up uh, men and women and teenagers for Sunday night. Can I tell you, he got on that bus in the morning at 7 a.m. 
And he wasn't finished until after he got back on the church parking lot about 9.30 Sunday night. He took his wife everywhere he went. And she just, loved, she adored him. She said, Billy, this is just absolutely wonderful. Look at those kids, you know. And, and he'd get on to them. He said, you don't behave that way in church now. I brought you. And the same man that brought you is the same man that could take you home. You know, and they'd sit up. He's a big old monster fella. Big fella. He's a big fella. But he loved serving God. And that's the way he served God. He just stayed on the bus all Sunday, just as happy as he could be. Now, I, I'm saying this. I, I'm saying that, uh, uh, you know, you, you be somebody that learns to delegate some things. Give people a chance to serve God. Hello? You ever see that people sing differently in our church? Uh, some people, they, they, they hold on to it right here. Nothing wrong with that. Other people stand back. Some people smile when they sing. Other people are so nervous they dare not smile when they sing. Yeah. Orchestra's growing, choir's growing, people volunteering to play the piano. Hey, use what you have for God. Uh, statement number next. Then evaluate, evaluate. You know, we must buy back that which we've wasted. I talked to a man not long ago, and I said, why are you so on fire for God? He said this. He said, the first 40 years, I gave the devil my life. The next 40 years, I plan on giving God my life. He said, I'm going to buy back some wasted time. And he's on fire for God. Look up your goals and vision. Uh, look uh, for ways to develop. Brother Bachman came in my office. I'm so glad he's back, and I'm glad God gave him and the boys safety. But he came in my office. He knows I like to read books on history, and I like to read books on leadership, time management, stuff like that. That's my cup of tea. I like For extra reading, I, I like stuff like that. And so he gave me a book list. He said, Preacher, if you ever want to uh, pick out some of these books right here, he said, here's a good book list. Now, uh, can I tell you, uh, look up, if you would please, ways to develop. Uh, look out, if you will, uh, for the direction. Keep going the right direction. Keep looking out. You know, when your daily tasks do not match your vision, uh, you're going to get frustrated. So make sure that your daily task matches your vision. It'll help you to redeem the time a whole lot better. You know, find ways that you can serve Jesus Christ. And by the way, can I tell you, not everybody is supposed to be preaching the Bible right now. Not everybody's supposed to be teaching a Sunday school class right now. Not everybody might ought to be in the choir right now. Now, there's going to come a time, Brother Palmore says, take that statement back. But I'm talking about there, there's times where you get in and you, you train and you grow and you train and you grow. And then we can't have everybody on the security team. It's not enough room. You understand? So find something that you can do as a church member. There's something you can do. Uh, we need greeters outside just to welcome people. When they drive up on the parking lot, you stand outside and say, welcome to Parkside. Amen. Then you bring them in to a greeter that's inside and say, hey, uh, they're here today and get their name and bring them in and say, and that person could say, hey, welcome to Parkside. And they could take them to a Sunday school class. Hey, that's an important role as we grow. See, there's something that you can do. Please don't do this. Please don't say, well, the only people that's important is people that are in the public eye. Nobody knew about Brother Weldon Moe. I'd say something from time to time, but most people would forget, you know. But every time I go out there, I'd take him some water from time to time or get one of the secretaries, take him some water. And he would say, I'm self-sufficient. I got my own water. I got my own gas. I got my own tractor. All I care about is just doing it for Jesus. That's all I care about. Now, can I tell you, that's the type of attitude that would carry you down the second mile. We have people that uh, is helping to do some typing in our church. And one dear lady in our church uh, went out and bought herself a brand new computer. Said, I I'll get my own computer. Just let me do something for the Lord. Isn't that a blessing? Amen. Come on. There's so much you can do to serve Jesus Christ. Redeem the time. 